Now, we're going to look at uh, those, that passage in Exodus 34. Now, if I do go on a little bit, don't worry, I will stop in time for you to get the ferry, honest. Or maybe not, I don't know. We'll keep you here for another couple of hours. Today, we're, we look at the story of Exodus 34, and uh, it's there that we witness a powerful encounter between Moses and the Almighty God on Mount Sinai. This is one of the truly wonderful stories which give us an understanding of God's compassion, of God's grace and His mercy. And it's in this chapter that we discover a God who is full of grace. He's full of mercy, and He's full of compassion. And it's a God who offers second chances. He offers you and me second chances despite of our shortcomings, despite of our sin. And this, this powerful story should be an encouragement to us. It's because we compare these moments, these moments, the stories of the Bible, the stories which we unfold by chapter by chapter and book by book, it's in those times that it's the power of the Holy Spirit that indeed he, he allows us to explore these moments in our lives. And that's the beauty of, of Scripture, of the Bible, of His living Word, that it, it reveals the stories of old to us in a way that we can then encounter what it means for us. There's no other book quite like it. Some books move you, and they, uh, they kind of warm your heart a little bit, but this is a living, breathing book which speaks directly into our hearts. And that's brought about by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. What it reveals to us today is that He's a God who loves us. And a God who wants to forgive us so that it transforms our lives. It transforms our lives to have a relationship with Him. But before we delve into this passage, a wee story to put, to bring us into this passage in a way that we can relate to. Once upon a time in a bustling city, there lived a man named Raymond, and he had a knack of getting into trouble. He was known for his impulsive decisions, often leading him down paths that resulted in mistakes and failures. Despite his good intentions, he found himself in a cycle of disappointment and regret. Perhaps we can think along those lines. I regret doing something, a disappointment that we didn't do something else better. And one day, Raymond stumbled upon a local community center. It's funny how it's a community center. I never thought about that one minute. Anyway, he, he stumbled upon a, a community center offering classes to help people turn their lives around. Intrigued, he decided to try it. There was a wise mentor named Michael who shared stories from the Bible. One story in particular caught Raymond's attention, the story of God and second chances in Exodus 34. Michael shared how the Israelites had broken their covenant with God, yet he chose to renew that covenant, offering them another chance. Raymond found comfort in this message. It felt like God was speaking directly to him through this ancient tale. He realized 
that just as God gave the Israelites another opportunity, despite their mistakes, there was hope for him. Raymond continued with attending the community center. He learned valuable life skills, built positive relationships, and began to make better choices. But as life often goes, he still faced challenges and occasionally stumbled. One day, he lost his job due to a mistake he had made. Discouraged and feeling like he was falling back into his old patterns, he remembered the story of Exodus. He reached out to Michael, who remembered him, and he remembered how God's love and forgiveness were not limited to a single chance. Just as the God of second chances offered grace to the Israelites, He was offered grace also. Raymond received that second chance. His realization renewed his hope, and he pressed on, learning from his mistakes, never losing sight of God's unwavering love and compassion. Over time, Raymond's life transformed. He found a new job, establishing healthier habits and even became a mentor at the community center. His journey was a testimony to the revelation of God's second chances in Exodus 34. So, with that story and this message from the Bible, I want to give you three messages this morning. Think of them as three text messages that have come at a crucial time in your life, at a moment when you're discouraged and you're, you're thinking, ah, this is not for me. You know, I can never live up to them other guys that I've been spending time with. Think of these three messages coming at this crucial moment. And the first message is that Israel, they broke their covenant. Just like we break our covenant with God. And in verse 1 to 9, we see that understanding of how they broke and what they did and how it was corrected. In the preceding chapters of this this passage, we see that the Israelites had broken their covenant by worshiping a golden calf. They made a calf out of gold and they started to bow down and worship it. And in response to their disobedience, God's anger burned against them. That's what the Bible said. It burned like fire into their hearts. They knew they'd done something wrong against God, and they couldn't look at Him. They couldn't, they couldn't look at even the mountain. Moses, though, Moses was like like a leader. He was like Jesus who intercedes for us today at His right hand, at God's right hand, at the Father's right hand. He, He lifts up to His Father and He says, you, you have done something wrong, but my Father will forgive you. This is one of mine, God, he says. And Moses did the same. He interceded on behalf of the people, pleading for God's forgiveness. In chapter 33 and verse 32, we see those words. We see that he pleads to God and says, don't don't pour your wrath upon them. God graciously prevailed a scene here with Moses, able to proclaim God's grace and mercy in chapter 34. He chose to renew His covenant with Israel. And this highlights God's willingness to restore and renew His relationship with us. This morning, He wants to tell you that despite all your failings, despite all your sin, He 
He wants a relationship with you, and that Jesus has taken those things, and He's nailed them to the cross, and they're forever there. He saved you. He set you free. He's released you from the chains of those burdens. We see that Moses, he clarifies for us the need for prayer. And I, I commend your leaders to their, their work and their, and their prayerfulness. The same with our elders here in Barvis, their prayer and their diligence to lift up you and me in prayer. You know, in Acts 17, 28, we see, for in Him we live and move and have our being. And as some of your own poets have said, we are His offerings. Therefore, since we are God's offerings, we should think that the divine being is like gold and silver or stone or image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance but now He commands all people everywhere to repent, for He has set a day when He will judge the world with justice by a man He has appointed. He has given proof to this to everyone by raising Him from the dead. This passage here relates to us making gods of things, of putting things in the way of God. And Paul brought it into the understanding of what happened with Moses. So, Paul spoke about Moses, and he says to us, we now have Christ in our lives who has taken away that sin. We don't have an idol. We don't have somebody who's like gold or silver. We have a Savior who died and rose again for us. And that's what He wants to relate to you this morning. Usually what I do is I, I give three uh, understandings within it. I give the circumstances of why this passage is so relevant to us. I give an illustration, and I give a life application. And here's the circumstances. Culturally, Israel was conditioned. And during their time in Israel, they were subject to pagan idolatry. They lived underneath the rule of Pharaoh, who was considered a god. And they were surrounded by Egyptian deities and practices. So this cultural environment, it, it was in their mindset. So naturally, when their leader went missing up, the, up Mount Sinai, they made an image because they thought that would save them. Perhaps in your times of moments of lapses from God, perhaps like all of us, you look to something else for comfort. You look to something else for a, an understanding. You make a God of something. Perhaps it's shopping. Perhaps it's social media. Perhaps it's, it's a friend group that you used to hang around with. Perhaps it's doing something that you once gave up for God. That's the cultural conditions that are around us. And just like the Israelites made a God of gold and silver, we make, usually make a God of material things around us. There's an illustration which fits well with this, and it says, imagine a potter who, despite the flaws of the clay, when he picks the clay up in his hand, despite the flaws and the way it, it doesn't look like anything, it doesn't resemble anything, he still decides to reshape that clay and make it into a beautiful vase or a plate or a pot or something that is useful. In the same way, we might not see ourselves as something very nice often. We might see ourselves as letting God down regularly. 
like that lump of clay, God, though, wants to make us into a beautiful, useful thing, something, a person who is, who is in the kingdom of God. We must recognize our brokenness and come before God with a genuine repentance. And if God's been speaking to you about repentance, which I know he, the, the leaders have been bringing you into that area this week, I want you to know that He is always ready. He is always ready to forgive and to restore us and to make us, sanctify us into that beautiful, that beautiful image that is His alone. So, that's the first message. What's the second message? The second message is, in this passage, God's revelation of His character is, is so evident. It's one of the most powerful passages that reveals God's mercy. He's a merciful God. He's a faithful God. He's a God who is eternal. When God revealed His name to Moses, have you ever noticed that before? It says, He revealed His name to Moses. Do you not think Moses knew His name? Well, he'd asked him plenty of times. Remember at the beginning of the the Exodus, when he went into Egypt, just before that he said to God, who will I say you are? Now, he knew God. He'd met Him on the, on the mountainside in the bush that was on fire, but he didn't, he didn't know a name. Very often, we, we, don't, we don't have a name for God. Yes, He's known as Jehovah. Yes, He's known as Elohim. Yes, He's known as the Lord. But that's not like a name we know, is it? It's not like our names. But like our names mean something to our parents and our relatives. They mean something to the folk around us. God's name is His character. God's name is His revelation to you and me. He's faithful. He's merciful. He's gracious. He's forgiving. He's forever. He's eternal. All of these things add up to who God is, not just a name. And we could go on and on and reveal His name, but what we see here is that the Lord said to Moses, I am the God who is almighty, who is powerful, all being, eternal. And he said one other thing. In that Hebrew text, he says, I am Emmanuel. I am God with you. Not in the sense of a person, but in the sense of His presence. And God is Emmanuel this morning. He's here with you and me. He's here in our midst. And He wants to say to you what He said, what was said to Moses here. He's slow to anger, abounding in love, faithful, and He maintains love to the thousands. And He's forgiven of all wickedness, rebellion, and sin. That's His character. That's His name. That's who He is to you and me. And you might see Him as just a loving God. That's all right. You might see Him as a wrathful God. That's okay in its time. You might see Him as your Father, as your Savior. Moses, he saw Him as the God who was boundless in love a God who was with him, and he wanted him to go with him. Remember, he kept asking you, will you go with me, God? Perhaps you're asking the same today. Will you go with me, God? See, when I leave Lewis, will you be with me, God? And his answer is yes. 
His answer is, wherever you go, I'll be with you. Wherever you are, whatever you're going through, I'll be with you. All you need to do is call upon my name. This is one of the earliest descriptions of God's mighty being. And it's a one that we can hold on to. And one of the things I want to do is I want to speak to you as an aspiring parent this morning. I noticed some of your ages, some of your ages looking for other people, and I want you to learn from this characteristic. Learn from this moment. God is a God who forgives and teaches. He corrects and He shows the way. That is what we must be as parents. We must love unconditionally. We must love to a point of forgiving those things that are done against us. And we must teach and speak truth into our children's lives. It's so important because there's a generation that is fallen short of that. And this is why we live in, a, in an, age, an age that is so disruptive and so angry with society because many parents didn't know how or what to do. And let's learn from those things. Let's learn from Moses. Let's learn from Joseph and Mary what they did as parents. What was the circumstance around this? Why were the people so wayward in their things? Well, the circumstances that there was a there was a bondage put upon the the Israelites while they were in Egypt. Many of the Israelites were born and raised in slavery, and they they didn't know any other way. They lacked the experience of personal freedom and self-determination, and that consequently they struggled to understand the concept of a sovereign God, of a God who was a Father, and loving, and merciful, and directive, and helpful. So what they did was they went their own way. They didn't go with God. A parent, the illustration is a parent who forgives a wayward child and embraces them with open arms is a loving parent, is an understanding parent, is a parent who is like God, who loves. And what's the life application for this? As, as God's children, we are called to reflect His character, to show compassion, forgiveness, and love to others. We to mirror the nature of our Heavenly Father. My third and last message for you this morning, we see that in verse 29-35 of Exodus 30, for we see the veiled glory of Moses. After spending time with God on the mountain, Moses faced the radiant glory of God. And his, he veiled his face when he was speaking to the people because they were fearful of him. They recognized that he had been in God's presence. This, com this point is, it's a, it's a revelation of God's glory, but it's also a revelation of how the law, the law that they were under and had to follow, couldn't completely show all of God's glory. The, the law was only placed there to reveal to them their sin. We have a different covenant 
We have a different understanding with God. Our glory is Jesus Christ, and it's in Him that we can shine. It's in Him that we can let our light shine in and around us. And today and this week, your light has shone in Barvis and in Stornoway and on the Isle of Lewis because you've revealed the presence of God in your lives. And I want to encourage you with that by saying that you, you are the light of God's glory through Jesus. You're not hidden behind a veil. The passage says, don't put a bucket over your head. Let your light shine. Let it shine around your friends, around your family members, around your school friends, around your work colleagues, around all who you come into contact with. And I'm sure you'll do that. The illustration is a bright light shining behind a thin veil. It represents God's presence with Moses. But we don't want to cover. We don't want to cover our light. We want it to shine. We want it to shine brightly on the hilltop so that all can see God has saved us. A life application is that in Christ we have a direct, a direct access to God's glory. And as believers, the Holy Spirit dwells within us, and it transforms us daily into the likeness of Christ. Just like the potter is transforming the clay, He's doing the same for you. He's transforming your lives to shine in that beautiful way. So, what does this conclude for us today? What does it reveal to us today? Well, not only that God is a God of second chances, but He patiently waits for us to turn to Him. Even if we falter or fail, he reveals this character of compassion and grace and love for each and every one of us. And that lets us humbly approach God, acknowledging our brokenness, but receiving His, free, His forgiveness. So, as we draw near to Him, His glory will shine through our lives, transforming us into vessels of love and grace. Remember, serve God who gives second chances, a God who redeems, restores, and loves us unconditionally. Remember Raymond's story that I told at the beginning. Raymond's story is not unique to him. I, I want to tell you that today. That's not just a story that's found in a book or online. It's not just a story that is black and white. It's a story that is colorful to you today, and you can accept that. You can accept that by when you realize and when you stumble, when you make mistakes, and you find yourself in a need of a fresh start, that we have a God who is a God who's willing to give you a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a hundredth, a thousandth. He'll give you that chance again and again. Never think you've done too much that you can't accept His love. Some of the older Christians in your circles, in your groups, will, will probably tell you, I've done things that would make your ha hair stand on end. I'm not proud of them. I'm not 
I'm not wanting to sing about them. But God forgave me, and He gave me a peace in my life which is beyond all measure. Raymond's story could be your story. It can be your story today. Just as He extended grace to them, He extends grace to us on our journey away from whatever we've been in. And today, as you go from Lewis, He goes with you. His grace and His mercy goes with you. You, you leave an empty church, maybe, but the summer holidays are nearly over, and we'll start to get some of our folk back who are away on holiday this week. But you've been an encouragement to us. You've been a wonderful experience of, of love and light and refreshed and invigorated lives for Jesus. And I want to thank you for that and offer you, if you want to stay, there's a manse there with a bedroom spare. There is a few places. Honestly, you could stay a couple of months, no worries. But if you ever want to come back, you are more than welcome more than welcome to come back, and please do get in touch with us if you're coming up to Lewis. We'll find somewhere for you to stay. You've been a blessing, and I thank you, and uh, I hope this message has sat well with you this morning, and indeed it encourages you that God is a loving God, and He's given us a Savior in Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing our last item of praise, our last item of praise in Mission Praise 506, How Great Thou Art. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works Thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, the power throughout the universe displayed.
Lord God, we declare how great Thou art, how wonderful Thou saving grace is. And Lord, as we come to the end of our service, and Lord, for the fire starters, the end of their trip to Lewis, we ask Your blessing upon our times. We ask Your blessing upon our lives. And we ask indeed that, Lord, Your face would shine upon us. And Lord, You would keep us that indeed, Lord, Your graciousness would be upon each and every one of our lives, and that, Lord, You would go before us, go before us in all we say and do and all we act like for the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.